Hello! In this video, we're going to introduce a new concept called chemical equilibrium. So what does that mean? So chemical equilibrium is the state of a system where the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. So for example, down below we have a reaction between hydrogen gas and iodine. So those are both diatomic molecules, and they can react to form two moles of hydroiodic acid. Now what's interesting is the reverse reaction can also happen. So notice we have double arrows here. So we've got an arrow for the forward reaction and an arrow for the reverse reaction. So uh, hydroiodic acid can actually decompose into hydrogen and iodine. Now chemical equilibrium is where, again, the rate of that forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. So down below we have this table where the x-axis is time or progress of the reaction, and the y-axis is just the rate of the reaction. So how fast is the reaction going? So if we just consider the forward reaction, let's say we start mixing together hydrogen and iodine. This is going to start with a really high rate of reaction, and then it's going to start decreasing as we start forming the product. And then the same thing will happen for the reverse reaction. So once we start forming some of this hydroiodic acid, we're, we're also going to see the reverse reaction. So then the rate of the reverse reaction will start increasing. And at a certain point, the rates are going to equal each other. And we hit that equilibrium state. So kind of interesting that this can happen. Now, chemical equilibrium can be attained whether the reaction begins with all reactants and no products, or all products and no reactants, or some of both. So down below, instead of the rate of the reaction on the y-axis, we have concentration. So let's say we start with a really high concentration of hydrogen and iodine. As the reaction proceeds, we're going to see a decrease in the concentration because it's, it's all getting used up, right? And as we start to form the product, HI, that concentration is going to increase because we're forming more and more of it. Now, eventually we're gonna hit a point where the concentrations stop changing. So the concentration of the reactants will stay the same and the concentration of the products will start to stay the same. And that's equilibrium. Now we could look at this other scenario. Let's say we start with all product and no reactant. So we're just gonna start with hydroiodic acid. So the concentration is going to start to decrease as it decomposes into hydrogen and iodine. And that means the concentration of hydrogen and iodine will start to increase as they form from the reaction. And then we're going to get this back and forth between the forward reaction and the reverse reaction until finally the concentrations stop changing. Now, chemical equilibrium is called a dynamic process because even though the concentrations have stopped changing overall, the forward and reverse reactions are continuing to occur even after we reach equilibrium. So it's going, the reactions are still occurring back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, um, but the concentrations have overall stopped changing. 
Now there are some conditions and properties for systems at equilibrium. So the system has to be closed and that just means that no other substances can enter or leave the system. So we don't want to contaminate the system. And again, equilibrium is a dynamic process. So even though we don't necessarily see the reactions, they are still occurring. And then at equilibrium, the rates of the forward and reverse reactions must be equal. And then lastly, the amount of reactants and products do not have to be equal at equilibrium. So oftentimes there's this misconception that the concentrations of the reactants and products are the same at equilibrium or the same as each other, but that's not always the case. Sometimes you have a bunch of reactants and very little product at equilibrium, or you have a bunch of products and very little reactant at equilibrium. However, those amounts will just stay constant at equilibrium. So let's talk about uh, an equilibrium constant, which will kind of help us to determine uh, more about the state of equilibrium for a reaction. So let's consider a hypothetical reversible reaction. So we've got reactants A and B, and they're forming products C and D. And we can also go in the reverse direction where C and D can form A and B. So we've got our double arrows here. Now, the lowercase letters represent coefficients. So uh, these would be for the balanced equation. Now, using this information, we can write what's called an equilibrium constant, or capital KEQ. So this is the ratio of the concentrations of the products to the concentrations of the reactants. So uh, each concentration is raised to the power of its coefficient in the balanced chemical equation. So down below, we have um, C and D in brackets, and the brackets just indicate concentration typically in moles per liter. So we're going to multiply the concentration of C by the concentration of D, so the products, and then divide that by the concentration of A times the concentration of B. And then notice that we have the coefficients as powers next to each one. So this is a little abstract, right? We, we don't have an actual equation here to go off of. So let's do an example problem. So let's write the equilibrium constant expression for the following reaction. So we have nitrogen gas reacting with three moles of hydrogen gas and that's producing two moles of NH3, which is ammonia. And of course, we could go in the reverse direction as well. We have our double arrows there. Now, on the last slide, we said that KEQ is equal to products over reactants. And more specifically, we're going to multiply the concentration of our product, in this case, NH3. Oh, and actually, we only have one product, so we don't have to multiply it by anything. But we do have a coefficient. So we're going to raise this concentration to the power of 2. And then we're going to divide that by the concentration of our reactants, N2, uh, times the concentration of H2. Now, nitrogen doesn't have a coefficient, or it's just one. 
So we don't have to write the coefficient for nitrogen. It's understood that it's just one. But for hydrogen, we do have a coefficient of three. So we're going to raise the concentration of hydrogen to the power of three. All right. Now let's do this one more time. So see if you can write the equilibrium constant expression for the following reaction, where two moles of CO2, carbon dioxide, decomposes into two moles of carbon monoxide plus one mole of oxygen gas. So pause the video, try to write the equilibrium uh, constant expression and then we'll go over it together. All right, so again, KEQ, we wanna put products on the top and reactants on the bottom. Oops, my pen stopped working. <laughs> Let's see. Might have run out of juice. Okay, so uh, we're going to multiply the concentration of carbon monoxide by the concentration of oxygen. And we have a coefficient of two in front of carbon monoxide. So we're going to raise that concentration to the power of two. Now there's only a, a one in front of O2, so we don't have to write that in our expression. Because anything raised to the power of one is just equal to itself. Now we're going to divide by our one reactant, CO2, and we're gonna raise that to the power of two, since we have a coefficient of two. All right, so not too bad. So now that we have these constant expressions uh, for equilibrium, what we would do is then run our experiment. And once we reach equilibrium, we would measure the concentration values and plug that into the expression. So equilibrium constants are determined using experimental values. So we would have to run the experiment, see what happens, and record the concentrations. Now, one thing we do have to keep in mind is the equilibrium constant does depend on temperature. So usually, if you look up a table of equilibrium constants, you'll find that they list the temperature next to the equilibrium constant. So just as an example, um, if we look up the equilibrium constant for the reaction between hydrogen and chlorine, which forms hydrochloric acid, we would see that it's equal to 1.6 times 10 to the 33rd at 300 Kelvin. So they very specifically ran this uh, experiment at 300 Kelvin. All right, so what does this value of K even mean? Because uh, that's a really large number. That's 10 to the 33rd power. All right, so remember, in general, KEQ is equal to products over reactants. So if we have a huge number, that tells us that the products are in a large amount, right? So a very large number uh, means lots of product. Now the opposite is also true. So if we had a really small number for our equilibrium constant, that would mean we have a lot of reactants. And this is why we care about the equilibrium constant. So the equilibrium constant can tell us if the reaction favors products or reactants at equilibrium. So 
uh, in essence, does the reaction form a high concentration of products or do we form barely any product? Now, because products are in the numerator of the equilibrium expression, if you have a value of K greater than 10 to the third, which is equal to 1,000, that indicates a strong tendency for the reactants to actually form product. However, if you have a value of K less than 10 to the negative three, so that would be one over 1,000 or 0 0.001, that indicates that the uh, reactants are favored at equilibrium. So we, do, we don't form very many products. So products are not favored. So again, this can tell us if uh, the forward direction of the reaction is favored or if the reverse reaction is favored. So here I have a little diagram showing the same thing we just talked about. So if your value of K is really small, that means you have a ton of reactants and very little product. So that means that the, re the forward direction of the reaction is uh, not going to happen to a big extent, right? Now, if you have a large value of K, that means you form a ton of product and you have very little reactant left at the end. So this means that the forward reaction is great. It, it goes really easily. You get a ton of product. And then of course we have our intermediate range. So if K is sort of in the middle, uh, that means that we probably have a similar amount of reactants and products at equilibrium. So they're both favored at equilibrium. And then down here, this is just uh, typed out what I just said. <laughs> okay, so let's do an example problem. Let's say a chemist runs the reaction shown below and measures the following concentrations at equilibrium. So the concentration of our reactant, N2O4, at equilibrium is 0 0.00140 moles per liter. So remember these brackets mean concentration. So the concentration of our reactant at equilibrium. And then the concentration of our product at equilibrium, NO2, is 0 0.0172 moles per liter. So let's calculate the equilibrium constant for this reaction. And then we'll figure out, are the products favored or are the reactants favored? All right, so first we should probably figure out the expression for our equilibrium constant. So remember it's products over reactants Okay, so let's put the concentration of our product in the top and it has a coefficient of two. So we're gonna raise this to the power of two. Then we're going to divide by the concentration of our reactant, N2O4. And that just has a coefficient of one, so we don't have to write that. All right, so let's plug in our concentration values. So our concentration of NO2 at equilibrium is 0 0.0172, and then we're going to square that. So raise it to the power of two, and then we'll divide by the concentration of our reactant, 0 0.00140. Now, what's really great about equilibrium constants, we don't have to worry about units. So KEQ, no units. 
So that's really nice, right? We don't even have to worry about that. All right, so let's plug this into our calculator. We're going to uh, square 0 0.0172, and then we'll divide that by 0 0.0014. Okay, so uh, I get a value of 0 0.21. Okay, so let's go back to our table. Okay, so 0 0.21. Um, 0 0.21 is actually an intermediate value. Uh, it's not really too large or too small. It's just kind of in the middle, right? So that means we likely have a lot of reactant and product at equilibrium. So we probably have approximately equal amounts of reactant and product. at equilibrium. All right, so let's do one more. So let's look at the reaction between gaseous sulfur dioxide and oxygen. Um, so this is actually a key step in the industrial synthesis of sulfuric acid, which is a really strong acid. Now, let's say a chemist runs this reaction and they ran this reaction at 800 Kelvin until the system reached equilibrium. And then the chemist measured the concentration of each reactant and product at equilibrium. And they found that the concentration of SO3, the product, was five times 10 to the negative two moles per liter. And then oxygen's concentration was 3.5 times 10 to the negative third moles per liter. And sulfur dioxide's concentration was three times 10 to the negative third moles per liter. So see if you can uh, calculate the equilibrium constant for this reaction. So first you'll want to write the equilibrium constant expression, and then you'll plug in the concentration values. So pause the video, try this on your own first, and then we'll go over it together. Okay, so let's write the equilibrium constant expression. So remember, products are going to go in the numerator. And we only have one product here, SO3. And it looks like we've got a coefficient of 2, so we'll raise this to the power of 2. And then we're going to divide by the reactant concentrations. So we've got SO2 in brackets, and we've got a coefficient of 2 for that, so we'll raise this to the power of 2. And then we'll multiply that by the concentration of O2. All right, so let's plug in these values. So SO3, we've got uh, 5 times 10 to the negative 2 squared. And then we're going to divide by uh, SO2, which was 3 times 10 to the negative 3 squared. And we'll multiply that by O2, 3.5 times 10 to the negative 3. All right, now, when you plug this into your calculator, uh, it's going to be a little complicated. <laughs> uh, so what you could do is first figure out what each of these values are squared, except for the value of O2. Write that down, and then you can plug that into your calculator if that's easier. Um, so let's see, we've got 5 times 10 to the negative second, uh, and then that's squared, and then we'll divide that by 3 times 10 to the negative third uh, squared, 
and we'll divide that by 3.5 times 10 to the negative 3. All right, I got a huge number, so I'm just going to run it one more time. <laughs> Let's see, 5e to the negative 2 uh, squared divided by 3 to the negative third squared, 3.5, maybe 3. Oh, I still got a huge number. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that it was correct. So I got 7.9 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4 as my value. So that's a huge number. All right. Now, what does a huge KEQ value mean? Are products favored or are reactants favored? Products, right? Because they are in the numerator. So if you have a huge number for KEQ, that means that products are favored. All right, so this actually brings us to uh, a principle that's really important with equilibrium, Le Chatelier's principle, which is named after a chemist. Um, so Le Chatelier's principle tells us that when a chemical system at equilibrium is disturbed by a stress, the system will respond in order to relieve that stress. So what are stresses? Well, this could involve a change in concentration of either reactants or products, or a change in temperature of the system, or a change in pressure of the system. So if we change the concentration, the temperature, or the pressure of the system, then the system wants to respond in a way that alleviates that stress or reduces that stress. So for example, if the concentration of one substance in a system is increased, the system will respond by favoring the reaction that removes that substance. So uh, let's say that we have a balance beam here. And let's say initially we were at equilibrium. So we had our reactants, our products, everything was happy. But then we added more reactant. Well, now we're no longer at equilibrium. We're at this other state. So how can we alleviate that stress? Well, a good way to do that is to make some of our reactant into product. So now the reaction is going to shift in a way that creates more product and we'll get back to equilibrium. So that's always the goal, get back to equilibrium. So for example, let's look at this reaction between nitrogen and hydrogen and we're forming NH3. But remember this reaction can also go backwards. We have that double arrow there. So what will happen to the reaction if the equilibrium is stressed by each change below? So what would happen if we added more hydrogen, which is the reactant? How will, e how will the system shift if we add even more H2? Well, on the last slide, we said that if we add more reactant, we're going to try to make more product, right? So in this case, we're going to shift the reaction forward and make more product. So the way that we would say this is the reaction shifts to the right towards the products. Now, what if we add more of the product instead of the reactant? So what if we add more of this? How can we alleviate that stress?
Well, we could always try to make more reactant and kind of get rid of some of that excess product, right? And hopefully by making more reactant, we'll get back to equilibrium. So we would say that the reaction shifts to the left. Now, another possibility, we could actually remove a reactant or a product. So what if we actually took away some NH3? What if we just completely removed some of that from the system? How would we get back to equilibrium? Well, we could always try to react more of the reactants so that we could get back some of that product that we lost, right? So if we remove something, the reaction is going to shift in a way to get some of that back or replace some of what we've lost. So the reaction is going to shift to the right. So this is in order to replace product. So kind of an interesting concept, right? Uh, chemists use this principle, Le Chatelier's principle, all the time to manipulate reactions. So for example, let's say you have a reaction that just does not want to form product. Maybe it forms a tiny bit of product, but it just really doesn't want to form any more product. Well, what you could do is remove that product and that's going to force the reaction to make more product. And you could just keep removing the product until everything reacts. So chemists use this all the time. So let's summarize. So according to Le Chatelier's principle, if we add a reactant to our system, which is a stress on the system, that means the reaction is going to move forward towards the products. Now, if we add more product, then the reverse reaction will be favored so that we can get rid of some of that added product and make more reactant. Now, we could also remove reactant from our system and the reaction is going to try to replace what we've lost. So the reverse reaction will be favored. Now, if we remove product, then we're gonna try to uh, relieve that stress. We're gonna try to replace that product that we lost. So in that uh, instance, the forward reaction is favored. All right. Now, there is a real-world application of Le Chatelier's principle here. So in aerobic respiration, which you'll learn more about in your bio classes, um, oxygen is transported to the cells using a protein called hemoglobin. So when we breathe in and out, oxygen has to get to different parts of our bodies, and hemoglobin is what transports oxygen throughout our system. Now, there is an equilibrium that exists here between hemoglobin and oxygen. So hemoglobin will actually bind oxygen and form what's called oxyhemoglobin. Now, at the uh, right-hand side here, I have a picture of hemoglobin, so it's pretty large. It has four different uh, subgroups there or units. And within each of those units, we have something called a heme group, and that's what binds the oxygen. Uh, that heme group also contains iron, uh, and this is partly why blood smells like metal or iron. Now, once a hemoglobin has delivered oxygen to the appropriate place, now it goes back to the reactant side. So oxyhemoglobin becomes just hemoglobin 
and the oxygen is going to do whatever it needs to do <laughs> wherever it's been delivered. So we go back and forth, right? So hemoglobin is going to go and get more oxygen, deliver it where it needs to go, go back and get more oxygen, deliver some more. It's kind of like Amazon trucks. They're, they're going back to the warehouse to get some packages, then they drop the packages off, and then they need to go get more packages. So kind of similar idea. Now, another stress that we can apply to a reaction is temperature. So increasing or decreasing the temperature of a system at equilibrium uh, is going to shift the reaction to alleviate that stress. So for example, let's say we have an exothermic reaction. So down below we have our same reaction between nitrogen and hydrogen, and it's forming NH3 ammonia. And this reaction releases heat. So this is exothermic. So we can actually list that amount of heat or energy as a product. So this tells us that the forward reaction is exothermic and the formation of ammonia, NH3, releases heat. Now let's say we add more heat. Let's say we apply heat, so we're adding energy. That means that we're adding more product. So if we add more product, we said earlier, that's going to shift the reaction in the opposite direction towards reactants. So adding heat or product is going to shift us back the other way. So the reverse reaction will be favored until we reach equilibrium again. So let's look at a different exothermic reaction. Let's look at this one between PCl3 and chlorine, Cl2. And this is going to form PCl5 plus some heat, some energy. So again, this is a product. Now, predict what would happen if we increase the temperature on this reaction. So pause the video, see if you can predict what would happen if we add more heat. Would we shift the reaction to the left or would we shift it to the right? Okay, so again, in an exothermic reaction, heat is a product. So if we add more heat because we're raising the temperature, that means we're adding more product. So if we add more product, the reaction shifts to the left. Oops, I missed a word. So the reverse reaction is favored. Because again, we're just trying to alleviate that stress. So if we can get rid of some of that heat uh, by forming reactants, then we will. All right, now let's look at another example. Let's look at this reaction between N2O4 uh, and heat, which will form NO2. So this time we have heat on the reactant side. Now, what do you think will happen if we decrease the temperature of this reaction? So essentially we're going to remove heat from this reaction. So pause the video and see if you can figure out which way the reaction is going to shift.
All right. So if heat is a reactant, that means it's an endothermic reaction. So heat is going into the system. So in an endothermic reaction, heat is a reactant. Now, if we decrease the temperature, we're essentially removing heat, right? So if we remove heat, that also means that we're removing a reactant. So if we remove a reactant, what do we need to do to reestablish equilibrium? Well, we probably want to bring back some heat, right? And it looks like we produce heat if we go to the left, if we treat the left as our product, right? Which can get a little confusing, I know. <laughs> um, so that means the reaction will shift left. to replace the lost reactant, which in this case was heat. All right, so um, we can also apply uh, pressure to our system to add stress to it. Um, but I'm actually not going to go over this into too much detail. Um, if you want to read through it in your textbook, you can. But I think temperature and concentration are more important uh, concepts to go over. All right. So uh, the next thing we're going to cover is osmotic pressure. So this has more to do with biology. So if you're interested in biology, this will be uh, our last video for this chapter.